And we move to Herve Paulino, who is going to talk to us about data-centric synchronization. Made practical, interesting. Thank you. So, I don't know if... So my name is Herve Paulino. I'll be presenting the paper, Atomic Data-Centric Synchronization Made Practical, conjoint work with Anamina Mats, Jan Sedequist, Max Junti, João Mats, and Antonio Ravara. We come from the University of Lisbon and the University of Lisbon. So the motivation of our work is the same of many other works on concurrent programming. So we know that concurrent code is paramount in today's um, software development, and also that concurrent code is diff difficult to write, and its correctness is very hard to assess, especially when the, 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 the code scales. And so concurrent code is the source of many execution error from data races, deadlocks, and atomicity violations. So, in this paper, we promote the, sh the use of data-centric synchronization, which shifts the expression of concurrency-related constraints away from control uh, structures, so code, to data declaration. And by this, it promotes a rather, rather distributing, uh, sorry, local than distributed reasoning. So the reference work in data-centric synchronization is atomic sets. In atomic sets, we have to explicitly group a memory objects that share consistency properties in uh, a set, and then reason which sets have to, we have to take into consideration when executing an operation, namely um, a method. So although being a seminal work, the atomic sets, so the model is rather complex, and so it has many keywords. For instance, it also requires, one to, when using a type, one to know the internal of the type. No, so no, to know if the, the type uses an atomic set and how this atomic set relates to the atomic set of the class we are implementing, or in the context of the method, we have to know the, so which parameters of the method have atomic sets and how they relate also to, so which of them we have to take into consideration when executing the method. So here, we propose a different approach. So we have our approach called the Thomas is type, type qualifier based. So we have uh, this atomic qualifier, type qualifier, that contrary to atomic sets, it has an impact on the type. So uh, type T and atomic T are not compatible, meaning that a value assigned to a, type, a variable of type T cannot be assigned to a variable of a type atomic T and vice versa. And that flows upwards the, the type tree. So if uh, type T implements an interface I, atomic T will implement atomic I, and these are also not compatible. So, uh, besides this, we also have that the notion of unit of work as atomic sets, which is a sequence of instruction whose execution must be perceived as an atomic operation. So this is atomic, it's in atomic, this translates to uh, an excerpt, so a portion of the method body that goes from the first axis to an atomic value, which is so not in calls. Atomic value, it's a value assigned to an atomic qualified uh, variable, so an atomic, for short, an atomic variable, to the last axis to an atomic value, also not in call. So from the first axis to the last axis, this is a unit of work that must be, must be executed, uh, must be perceived as an atomic operation for the remainder of the system. So what is the programmer called to do? He has to place all the values that he wants to be accounted for in a unit of work in um, atomic, so atomic annotated types. Um, if, when it does so, if these annotations are, if, uh, are consistent, a compilation process will generate code that's free of data races, atomicity violations, and deadlocks. So to do so, um, the programmer is called to annotate uh, fields at class level, so it must annotate the fields. So it must provide atomicity information about the fields, only the fields, nothing else, at, at classes. So this atomicity information, so it's the type is left bare, means that the, the type is non-atomic. With atomic keyword, naturally means that is atomic. We also have this atomicity of annotation that allows to, uh, for fields to share the atomicity of another. So have the atomicity of, so say that one field has the same atomicity of another field or even of a type parameter, as we'll see further ahead. Uh, the programmer is also called to, at interface level, to say for each method, which are the combinations uh, of atomic, not atomic, they are, must be supported uh, for each um, method parameter and return type. So the notations are the same as above, with the exception here of all. When applied to a parameter or return type, it means that implementation of that, of that method must support both atomic and non-atomic for that parameter or for the return. 
we'll see an example ahead. So here we have a list of atomic objects. So it stores atomic objects. So when we store, the objects must be annotated with atomic. And when we retrieve, we also receive an atomic object. We also have here another method. This contains all that checks if the current list contains all the elements of another one given as argument. And here, it must support both atomic and non-atomic lists. Okay? Here, we have your implementation. So this is a concurrent list that stores atomic objects, meaning that besides storing atomic objects, the list itself may be um, used concurrently, so concurrent assertions and removals, and it does so by saying that all nodes, that's here, node of atomic, I'll go into that, um, must be accessed in units of work, and so we annotate them with this keyword atomic. So a node of atomic is, for short, um, a node of an, uh, that stores an atomic object. Note that we don't need to annotate nothing here uh, on the meta definitions. All the, um, uh, the annotations will be inferred. I'll, well, I won't have much time to go to that, but I'll lightly or briefly explain ahead. So here are the semantics, also briefly. So we, as I said before, each method that access an atomic value, so for the first access, not in calls, to the last one, not in calls, has a unit of work. So a method that features a unit of work, this unit of work must be perceived in an atomic operation, meaning that no other units of work executing must, may see intermediate versions of the state that's being manipulated by this method, meaning by the, its unit of work. So an example here. This is L1 contains L2, so checking if list L1 contains list L2, it starts by reading L1, then L1 and L2. So here are the two bars, meaning that it's executing its unit of work. If concurrently we have an insertion in L1, this insertion will have naturally to wait until uh, the first method has released the list L1. When it does so, so it will compete to acquire this resource, and if it does, it may execute its unit of work. Of course, uh, others that operate over different objects may execute concurrently. So, I won't have time to go also deeply into this, but we have to consider the composition of units of work. A, a simple example is a transfer in a bank account, which itself does not directly access uh, atomic states, but it uses a withdrawal operation and a um, deposit operation that both access an atomic balance. So deposit and withdrawal will have uh, units of work, but transfer will not, because it, it does not access an atomic value. Uh, regardless, we want this operation to be atomic. Uh, for performance issues, we do not autom automatically, automatically compose every unit of work. What we do is, so we issue warnings for all these, so all these cases, so for the um, the programmer to handle them, and then we have policies for more conservative, more conservative to full conservative. To, sorry, for less conservative to full conservative. Um, the programmer may choose one of these policies and then even adjust the policy for individual methods by using these annotations, unit of work, saying this method must have a unit of work and no unit of work, so this method must be an exception and not have a unit of work. So one also, a diff one novelty of this, of our work, is the, we leverage on type parameters, meaning that we can encode the atomicity of a type on a type parameter. And we do this either at class definition, here we have a, a class of only atomic types, or a class, where a type use, where we say, for instance, that this class C extends D, and D, the, so the type parameter of D must be atomic. With this, so, the type parameters now have this atomicity attribute, and this may simplify greatly the implementation of our examples. For instance, here, now we revisit the list example. We have a list of t's, and t as the type, both the type of the element and the atomicity of the element. So here, we, have, we may remove the annotations of atomic because the atomicity of the element is given by the, the atomicity of t. So for a list, for instance, of atomic objects, here T will be atomic. For a list of regular objects, the T won't be atomic. So if you go here now to implementations, first we have here a node of T's that may be, once again, atomic or not. And here, we now our, our list implementation will start by a base list, 
that besides the, um, uh, the T uh, element, so the T type with the, the type of the elements, we have now have a new type parameter N where we will, that we will use to encode the atomicity of the nodes. So N extends node, and we use this N now to declare the nodes of the, um, of the list. And if N is atomic, we'll have a list of atomic nodes. And if N is not atomic, we'll have a list of not atomic nodes. And so we can write the concurrent list simply by extended base list saying that the nodes must be atomic and a list of sequential, so non-concurrent, with uh, saying that node is not atomic. Now, if you want to have a concurrent list of atomic nodes, of atomic objects, sorry, we simply write it this way. So, brief, going quickly through our compilation pipeline, we have the first case. So, we have this atomic class specialization. So, this atomicity property of the, of the, type, of the type parameters cannot be erased by, type, by, by Java's type erasure. So, what we do is we have to generate a class for each of the, um, the combinations. So, for this base list, we'll have four versions of the class. Um, and then, these four versions go through the rest of the pipeline. So, I'll just focus on some of the stages. Here is where we infer the atomicities for the methods. So, we have the notion of method variant, which is the version of a method with a combination of atomic, non-atomic for its parameters and return type. We check for each of these combinations if it's safe or if valid or, value or not. So, if it's safe, uh, in the sense that this does not um, break this rule that atomic values cannot be assigned to non-atomic variables and vice versa, the ones that are deemed invalid are removed. And then we have to make sure that there are no, there are no calls, to, all calls to methods are calls to valid variants, and also, given that we have removed some of the variants, we have to ensure that the, inter the interfaces that the classes must implement are still implemented. So if a class, for instance, asks for a method that receives an atomic value and that and the implementation with so uh, makes that variant invalid that we'll have to say that the interface is not um, is not being implemented so at the end having the, the type safe code we generate the conc concurrency control so currently we currently we use locks uh, we have a lock based well, love injection or inference algorithm inspired here an auto locker and we use either mutual exclusion or read write locks um, so, the properties, although not presented here in the paper, we have um, so formal implementation of the formalization of the, of the language in Olong, what you call Atomis Olong. Olong is a core language, a concurrent core language. Um, we have formalized the inference of the qualifiers. We have type soundness mechanized in Coq. We also have variable soundness up to lock injection. So, up to this point here, but not yet mechanized. And as I'll say later, we are working on the formalization of the lock inference. So going to numbers also quite quickly, we have applied the Thomas to several uh, use cases. Here we have some Java collections. So here are the annotations that we use. Um, you can see that there are slow, so smaller than the original locks. Uh, more than this, the currency control is, cent is centralized on the, um, the declaration, not dispersed along the code in locks and unlocks. Um, but this number of notations can be further decreased if you use the type parameters. So this is without type parameters, this is with type parameters. Of course, type parameters cannot be used in every case, but in this case, we can. This is the number of extra type parameters. So besides T, if did we add to add a new type parameter, as we did for the base list with that N, so in some cases we had, in this case we hadn't. And these are besides the type parameters. Sometimes we had to use annotations that are of the type atomicity of, just to spread the atomicity of the, of the type parameter across several fields. So I say that several fields have the, the atomicity of that type parameter. Uh, also have information about units of work, so we have to reason about its composition in some of the, of the examples. So, regarding compilation time, just say that currently we have go, so the average time is around, let's we'll say, five seconds. Uh, it's under 20 seconds for the, the so, so, typo here, all the, the, the examples that we tested, and, but there's still room for optim, uh, optimizations, so we duplicate a lot of codes, and we can reduce the compilation time if, so we compile everything, and we can 
reduce it. So, but unless it's so, it's uh, compatible for use. Uh, some runtime performance with some examples of the Java collections. We may see that we are here. So we have versions for atomic read-write and using time parameters. In fact, is negligible. Uh, so we are competitive with the Java versions of so the Java uh, concurrent API only when we, we use mutual exclusion. So this is given the nature of Java's read-write locks. I can discuss that on offline if you want wants to. Here, on this case, uh, they use synchronized locks, and in this version of Java, Java 17, I think, I don't know why synchronized locks performance is very bad, so we're, we're able to, um, to be better, but if we replace the synchronized locks, the synchronized locks by locks, so the results will be are uh, roughly the same. So we are competitive, we lose some, a little bit, but sometimes, but not that much. So, to conclude, so we propose a Thomas, which is a novel data centric synchronization um, model with some distinct, distinct features. So, it's based on this type qualifier that has impact on the types, um, requires only a notation of interfaces and class fields, everything else, so local variables, um, so the qualification of parameters, local variables, and return times is inferred, and we generate. So, if we have two versions of the same method, one that, is, that receives um, an atomic value, not that does not. We generate versions for both, so code for both. Um, so it also uses Solaris type parameters to encode the atomicity on these type parameters. We have a Java implementation that shows the viability of our, uh, of our approach in real life code. So, as I said, completion time is suitable for practical use, and the runtime performance is comparable with the lock based implementation that we have tested against. Uh, we have so that formal definition all along that provides the framework for providing um, formal properties. So as I said, we have mechanized all the the, um, the type, so the the inference of the qualifiers, and we have so proved the type soundness. We are the variable soundness is um, also proved, but it's not yet mechanized. We're working on this, and now we are working on the soundness of the unit of work, a lock inference algorithm, and that's it. Hi, yeah, a couple of questions, one of which is um, how does this relate to the more qualifier heavy forms of um, concurrent languages, things like Pony, where you have 15 different qualifiers? Have you thought about Sorry? that? How, how does this relate to systems like Pony uh, or languages like Pony? I don't know exactly what's, is, what's your, it relates in what terms? Pony. I don't know Pony. So the you haven't come up. Okay, it's one of these things which has, you know, immutable pointers and isolated pointers and shareable pointers and this sort of thing. Yeah, but in that, so in that kind, that kind of languages, so you have to explicitly state, so what is shared or what is not. So you have to, oh, so here as well. So we have to say what is atomic, and then we infer all the control. Right, I mean, what, what you, have? you only have one particular qualifier there that doesn't constrain the heap. So, you yes. just have one qualifier, whether it's atomic yeah. and not atomic, and that doesn't constrain the heap, I think. Doesn't constrain the heap? Yeah. Well, it's, no, it does not constrain. What it does, and when we execute something, so it guarantees that all, everything that is atomic qualified is executed in that unit of work. Right. right. Yes. It, yes. But it does not constrain the heap. The only thing that it, it's, what it does, you can now separate the heap on atomic values and non-atomic values, and these are not. You cannot assign values, so part of the atomic heap, to the regular heap, and vice versa. That, this is what provides provides you uh, the the ground or the foundation for not having atomicity violations or, yeah, or races. Sure. Yeah. So in that way, what we do is we separate the heap into. Yeah, I was just wondering how it related to the stuff with more complicated heap topologies. And my other question was, um, are the sort of generic things you're using there similar to the stuff that I think Alex Tannen did with, uh, for generic ownership in Java? It looked look quite similar. 
sorry, the only question um, the, the way you were encoding atomicity uh, yes. into the type parameters in Java seems similar to the way that Alex Patanen encoded ownership types in Java. He also uses um, the type parameters? Yeah. Okay, didn't know. Yeah, thank you. Well, happy to talk to you if you catch me. Let's thank Hedve again.